Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And tonight we'll be talking about reaching out to other people. Our guests tonight are both associated with the Mother of Hope Orphanage in Jordan, just outside of Amman. Our guests are Sana Hussein, you are the chair of the Chicago Committee for the Orphanage, and Father Malik Rihani. Um, so, both of you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, let's uh, start with a little background. That's always helpful. So, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, what the orphanage, and there's a school attached to it, um, what, how it came about, the town it's in Andhra, in, in, in Jordan. So, um, Father Malik, why don't you start sure. with a little bit of the history? Yeah. Well, thank you again, and uh, first, God's blessings to you and your family and all of our listeners. Thank you. Um, uh, the country of Jordan, uh, as you may recall from perhaps biblical stories and others, is very prominent uh, in the theology of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Of course, our Lord was baptized there. Um, there are many stories in the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament uh, of the different places within Jordan that have become very prominent. They become pilgrimages and and uh, other important uh, historical and uh, archaeological uh, finds. Uh, the town of Anjara is situated uh, in the northern part of Jordan, uh, not far from the Sea of Galilee, mm. so beautiful mountainous area. Um, and Jordan uh, is one of those uh, unfortunate Middle Eastern countries that has no oil. Yeah. So, <laughs> not a that very... That may be a blessing. It may be a blessing, absolutely. Uh, but very limited resources. It's three-quarters desert. Uh, and the, the double whammy for Jordan is um, because of, of the history of the Middle East, uh, Jordan has become home to so many refugees, uh, starting with uh, mm -hmm. the first one in 1948 when the Palestinians fled, uh, the second one in 67, uh, you know, the Six Day War mm -hmm. with Israel. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, Arabs within themselves, uh, there was uh, the civil war in Lebanon that lasted almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these refugees came to Jordan. Uh, you know, God bless the Jordanian government. They're really very uh, hospitable to, to refugees. Uh, the war in Iraq, the two uh, Gulf Wars in Iraq, mm -hmm. also a lot of Iraqi refugees. Uh, refugees from Egypt, from Libya, and now most recently, almost the last four years, the terrible war in, uh, in Syria. Over 200,000 mm -hmm. people have been killed there, civil war. And uh, Jordan had opened its northern border also uh, for Syria. And... Uh, uh, probably approaching a million refugees from Syria and into Jordan. So uh, there's no money there to help. And Anjara is about maybe 30 miles or so from the Syrian border. Uh, so we expect that uh, in the perhaps near future, sadly, there will be more refugees coming in, and especially when it comes to the, the really the most vulnerable, and these are the, the orphans, uh, be it through war or other domestic issues. Uh, somebody has to take care of the orphans. So this little town of Anjara, uh, although very poor materially, very rich spiritually, and a church opened there almost 100 years ago uh, for the people of Anjara on a, on a religious site uh, that's believed to have been the place, it was a cave where our Lord and His disciples would travel from Galilee to what is called the Decapolis, which, is, which means 10 cities, mm -hmm. which is mostly in, in Jordan. So on, on that site, an Italian priest came and, and he opened up a church. And that church, over time, uh, uh, grew slightly, a little bit, based mm -hmm. on the resources. And uh, only about 10 years ago or so, they started taking orphans in. Uh, so, uh, and the church is also Mother of Hope, right? Yes, I'm sorry, church. that's, that's right. the name of the church, the Mother of Hope. It's a Roman Catholic church, mm -hmm. uh, obviously supported by the Catholic Church uh, mm -hmm. in Jordan. Uh, I have a, f a family that lives in Jordan, uh, so does my wife, so periodically we, we go visit. And a few years ago, I went to visit that orphanage uh, to meet the priest there. Uh, and uh, I brought the issue back to some of our colleagues here, you know, dear friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to do something about that. So uh, I, I'm not a Catholic priest, I'm an Orthodox priest. Uh, and, and in fact, I should point out that yes. You are not a Catholic priest, and so now you are not Christian. And so here Correct. we're talking about uh, a Catholic orphanage, but you as an Orthodox priest and you as a Muslim are still involved right. in, in bringing this together, yeah. which is, after all, the objective, I think, that all people who are looking at the Middle East would like to achieve, which is Absolutely. a sense of unity yeah. rather than the divisiveness we so yeah. often see there. Correct. Yeah. You know, the ironic thing also, the, the town of Enjur, that area historically, uh, is the place where several peace pacts took place 
uh, not recent history, but the days of Abraham and yeah. Isaac and Jacob yeah. and Esau, the two brothers who had conflicts, uh, made a peace pact there. Uh, Jacob uh, and Laban also made a, a peace agreement uh, where they committed a lifetime peace with one another. So we're hoping that uh, history repeats yeah. itself. Uh, and with our efforts, as you know, God bless her, my dear sister in humanity here. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, she's not a Christian, but she's leading our effort uh, to show that humanity has to, to rise above everything else. Uh, and, uh, you know, we may not be able to change the world, but maybe one soul and one person at a time through our actions, uh, we can affect some positive change that's really much needed. And who needs it more than the orphans? Uh, the children, so, as we all know, are the future. So they, they if are. we uh, abandon them, well, we're abandoning ourselves. We're abandoning ourselves, yeah. our future. And, and I think our Lord had a very special pray, place in His heart for children. He said, let the little children come to me. Yeah. And He reminded the adults, uh, if you don't become like these little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So because our Lord had a special place in His heart for children, uh, we must do likewise. Yeah. So, Sana, you're here on the, on the other side of the, uh, of the ocean. Well, Actually, both of you live in the Chicago area, but uh, you are the uh, chair of the Chicago committee, right, on behalf of the of the orphan. Well, the orphanage in particular, right? But uh, everything is connected: the church, the school, the orphanage. Exactly. Right? So, how was the Chicago committee formed? What transpired here to get you to get you involved and to form the committee in the first place? Well, first, I'd like to state that as a Muslim, uh, the Quran states that all of humanity is created by one Creator. So we are all the children of God, and um, that's what Muslims believe, that's what I believe. And so when I was approached um, with respect to this project, I didn't even have to think about it. Um, I just jumped on board. And um, one of uh, Father Malik's uh, parishioners, Gaid Akawi, had asked for a meeting with me, and he had just come back from Anjara. He, he had spoken to Father Malik, and Father Malik explained the issues that were happening uh, with the church. So he went for himself and also uh, investigated the matter and met with the priests and the parishioners there. And he came back to Chicago and asked for a meeting and described the situation and told me that the, the boys' home was filled to capacity. So um, the homes were just established around 2005 and they're already filled to capacity. So there's a home for the, uh, the toddlers and the young children up to the age of 10 where they're co-ed. And then there's a home for the girls, for the teenagers, and a home for the boys, for the teenagers. The home for the boys is the one that's filled to capacity. And I should uh, clarify, these are not all orphans. The, the church uh, seeks to assist any uh, child who is orphaned or abandoned or abused or even if they're none of those but just having issues with their families, they also bring them in and counsel them. And the goal with those children is to get them back into their homes to resolve the situation and the problems between the children and their families. But I would imagine that's particularly important with the teenage boys, right? And I would think that there's exactly. much more likelihood of conflict within the family at that age. Exactly. But a lot of it, it, it appears that um, statistically, it seems that they're, um, they're abandoned children and orphan children. Now, is this driven largely by the, we talked earlier about the influx of refugees into Jordan uh, throughout the country, but is um, the orphanage, uh, you said, just started in 2005. Uh, is it driven largely by the influx of, of refugees, or are the, is it a mix of natives and, and refugees? How, what's, the, what's the reason for the growth? It appears to be a combination of both. I think that, as Father Malik described, um, with all the refugees, the influx that has been happening over the years, and especially recently with the war in Iraq and now the war in Syria, I don't, I don't think that Americans understand uh, the impact of that number of refugees on a country. I mean, here in America, we don't accept mm -hmm. uh, refugees. We had the children at the borders, and we were rioting regarding um, whether yes, we should let, let, let them in or not. And they're literally escaping because their lives were, were at risk. Um, it, Jordan's a very small country, and... What is the population of Jordan? I want to say about it? 4 million. Uh, if so you, a if million you include refugees. all the refugees, uh, yeah. it's, it's probably around 5 million yeah. by now, with all the Syrians that, that came in, yeah. But I mean, yeah. in terms of that, that's uh, it's a high percentage. Twenty percent of the population at yeah. this point is. And refugees. actually, if you include all the the Palestinian refugees and their descendants and their children, yeah. it's more than half the population. Right. So yeah. this is a, a huge influx it, of, it of is. people, huge. and uh, yeah. handling that is quite a balancing act. It um, is. Actually, it's a 
it's a tribute to the stability of the country of Jordan that um, that it has not blown up as a result yeah, of this. You're right. Maybe uh, it's these holy exactly. sites that are keeping it in place. Maybe yeah. our Lord is watching over Jordan and it would be whatever nice the to reason think that. is. Yes, yeah. really, to yeah. think that there's some greater power sure. that's keeping this some under control. Some greater power, absolutely. Yeah. But there's also an impact on the citizenry. I mean, as much as the government can sustain um, the refugees and assist them, we have to also look at what's the impact on the community. And if the, if the refugees are coming in and we understand that with the poor refugees who need the assistance, you know, the impact is on the government with respect to uh, mm -hmm. sustaining them. But then there's an impact on the common citizens. If the refugees are wealthy, are fleeing, and they have the wealth to flee, they're coming in and they're able to buy property and they're able to sustain themselves or get jobs. And so now there's a competition um, that arises. And mm -hmm. so that, that um, I think, leads to economic hardships on the citizens. And if that's the case, then you've got children who may be abused or abandoned, either who are refugees or they may be children of, you know, from the community who mm -hmm. are actually Jordanian or um, Palestinians of Jordan, you know, who were born in, and raised in Jordan, but their families just can't afford to, uh, to take care of them. So um, there, there are a lot of different uh, consequences as a, real, as a result of taking in that amount of uh, refugees, and that's in addition to the societal problems. That so we're what role then is the orphanage itself, and, and of course the school as well, um, what, can that, what role can that play in trying to settle out some of these, um, some of these issues? I mean, it, it is, it's a religious institution, right, so that there are certain precepts, I'm sure, that govern how the orphanage is run and, and, and how the children are treated. Um, is there any kind of um, sense that they're trying to train a generation to be peaceful and to learn how to get along with each other? Is that part of the mission? Yeah, well, uh, actually, uh, whether that's a, a direct goal or not, I'm sure that's going to be a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. When you have uh, 220 students, half Christian, half Muslim, play together, enjoy a meal together, uh, and learn to live in harmony together. Hopefully, th the, these children become the new leaders, and they can remember their youth mm -hmm. and their younger days. That there is really no reason to to argue to the point of becoming violent. That you can always solve things peacefully. And uh, the school is under the direction, uh, as everything in the Catholic Church, under the the church and the bishop and the mm -hmm. hierarchy, etc. So uh, you know they are guided by rules, and they have to follow the rules. Uh, uh, they do teach religion, uh, but. Uh, you know, the, the Christian students go study Christianity mm -hmm. and the Muslims study the Islamic religion. Mm -hmm. So they respect each other's differences. Uh, and this happens within the same school. Within, within the same school, exactly. I mean, I yeah. just stop to consider that for a moment. Please. That in you know, the world where so much of the, what we hear on the news media uh, paints these irreconcilable differences mm -hmm. between the Christian West and the Muslim East, uh, and the idea of the Muslim schools that are breeding grounds for terrorists, and, the, and, and you know, you hear all this, and so some of it just naturally sort of sinks in. But here's a case where one school is being—they're teaching religion, they're teaching both Christianity and 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 teaching Islam, um, Islam in the same building mm -hmm. with essentially the same student body, and there's no conflict. And, well, I shouldn't say there's, I mean, there is some no, conflict. Not between but, them, there's no but conflict. It, but it's working, yeah, it's right? It's working. I mean, that's yeah. a, a, it's an incredible example, I think, to what the world could look at and say, look, there is an alternative path here, and we're demonstrating it. I mean, is that, is, is that, yeah. is that part of the message that, that the, the, the school and the orphanage sure, are trying absolutely. to present? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and, and we, we do hope that these leaders who make decisions to kill and behead and murder, that they, they do come and they visit. And, and see firsthand how mm -hmm. people can get along. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't take... Uh, now you, haven't, you haven't invited anybody from ISIS yeah. to come and visit, though, right? You know, the fear is always there that they may end up anywhere. We don't yes, know. Yes. Uh, but if, if God does want them to end up in Jordan and, and they see firsthand how these children mm -hmm. of different faiths are getting along so well together, uh, maybe that's what it takes to change their heart, you know? Uh, what's impossible with man is, is possible with God, so we, mm -hmm. we never know. Yeah. <laughs> But if I can also uh, add to that, this isn't just a testament to, uh, to this region and to this church. Um, historically, in Palestine, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, in Nazareth, as well as um, in Jordan, and especially all over Jordan, I mean, Jordan is predominantly Muslim. However, we've never heard of any conflicts between Muslims and Christians. And that's because there is respect between Muslims and Christians in, 
in Jordan as well as in the West Bank. And it's like that in other countries as well, in Lebanon. There may have been incursions and problems between Muslims and Christians, but there are also there is also a lot of cooperation between certain segments. It just depends on what's going on politically usually. So um, Well, I'm glad so you raised that. It, it, not to voice too much of my own personal opinion, but sure. I think that most of the, if not all, of the so-called religious conflicts are actually political conflicts. Yes. Mm -hmm. And religion is being wielded as a tool in those conflicts. Um, yeah. And it's really about power uh, rather than religious differences. Although the religious differences are brought to the fore and people are led to believe that it's about religious conflict. Mm -hmm. My real feeling is that at, at root, it's just being used by those who find it convenient to use yeah. the, the terminology and the concepts of religion to create what are essentially, or to fuel, political conflicts. Yeah. Because they know how powerful of an emotion religion is. Mm -hmm. And to get to the heart of a person, you invoke religion. And that gets people's attention, and they can get them on your side. Uh, but if you, you think know, God wills it, yeah. then you're more <laughs> likely to do it. You know, it's very yeah. difficult to imagine uh, a religious person to say Allahu Akbar, which really invokes the greatness of God. That's what mm -hmm. Allahu Akbar means, God is great, great beyond anyone or anything else. And with that same breath, take a knife and, and behead a fellow human being. It, it is beyond my understanding. Uh, I, I just cannot imagine doing that, and I cannot imagine anybody accepting that as being normal behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Uh, I, and I think, um, to come back to the orphanage and the school, to present a model that's so different, uh, as uh, to put it in religious terms, I mean, it, it's, it may be a way of, of God saying, look, <laughs> hey, yeah, it's working here, yeah. right? Exactly. Or even from secular terms, it's just a way of saying, you know, all of these things may be false constructs. Let's take a look at this alternative example. Exactly. And our committee uh, in Chicago is, is comprised of Muslims and Christians. Uh, we have a committee of 11 people, and out of the 11, I believe, five of us are, are Muslim. And that's not why they were chosen. The people who were, uh, who were chosen were chosen for their experiences, their ability to assist with respect to the project, what they can contribute in areas of their expertise as well. It had nothing to do with um, having a model or comprising it of, of Muslims or Christians. Mm -hmm. We chose individu individuals that we thought would best serve uh, the project because this isn't um, a temporary project. Our immediate goal is to build uh, this home for the teenage boys and to expand uh, the orphanage and the home. And you're raising money for that as well, by the way, right? Exactly. Our goal just for this home is $300,000. Uh, we've about, raised... How far along are you about? We just started, so we just raised 30000 So you're just so getting started, just getting off the ground, right? Exactly. And we actually have a uh, fundraiser. It's a presentation uh, to introduce the project and then to seek uh, sponsorships and fundraising. And it'll be held on Saturday, November 29th. So for those who are looking at this online, that's still yet to come. Exactly. Those who are watching on television, it's a little bit in the rearview mirror. Yeah. Right. Um, but there will be other events, right? There will be. Uh, th there will be events um, until we get it built, and the goal is to have us uh, break ground by uh, January, February, and have it built by the summer. But uh, the local people are expected to also share the burden. Uh, mm -hmm. They will be taking care of the 20 percent, is it? Yes. Yeah. So we want we want that shared responsibility. 20 percent of the cost. Of the yeah. cost, yeah. And our committee will, will try to collect the other 80 percent. It's important mm -hmm. for them also to feel part of it, that you don't want all these Americans coming and building it for them. That well, that's a good question. Blood. Who actually will do the building? Will it be the local people? Local people, people? yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So they will have not just a monetary investment in it, uh, uh, right. investment of labor and love, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so um, you talk about it being ongoing. So after this addition is built, uh, or the extra home for the student boys, uh, teenage boys, um, how do you see this evolving over the, in the future? Well, there, the school, as we mentioned, mm -hmm. is is on um, the property where uh, where the church is located, mm -hmm. and the school was formed in 1890 <laughs> in a small building. And Might then need it, a little updating. Yes, and then a new building was constructed in 1922. So that's the facility that's being used right now, and we're hoping to update it and, mm -hmm. if necessary, expand it. We're hoping to also um, add uh, a soccer field for the children and then to update the rest of the buildings. Is Andra a growing community then as well? I mean, it's, it's so that the need is going to continue to It's going to continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jordan in general is a growing community, mm -hmm. uh, be it from the refugees or just the, the natural growth. Yeah, it's growing. 
Well, I would think the attraction of a, a stable place to live, especially in times like now where there seems to be such instability throughout the Middle East, that having that attraction of a, you know, a stable country where it's peaceful and you can go and make a living and raise your family must be very attractive to people. So even if it's not uh, refugees, I would imagine it's a draw for it immigrants. It is, relative to all the countries around it as well, around Jordan. I mean, every country you look around that surround Jordan, there are issues going on. Mm -hmm. Political, violent, there's all kinds of issues going on. So, so far, by the grace of God, Jordan is a safe, safe haven. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and, and I think the fact that they are welcoming all these uh, refugees and taking care of them, as we said, maybe God has blessed them and, and will protect them and keep them safe. Uh, because I tell you, if, if Jordan falls, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a huge tragedy in the Middle East because Jordan has the longest border with Palestine and Israel as mm -hmm. well. So, if that country falls apart, uh, God help us. Uh, I mean, we, we are now at the point of the only thing that's going to save us is divine intervention as it is. <laughs> so if Jordan yeah. falls, but in the end we just have to do our part. You know, we focus on the little kids mm -hmm. and we have to let God take care of the greater good for all of us. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a, an organization that uh, Sana knows I've been associated with that, that builds uh, health clinics and schools in, in Pakistan and their, uh, their feeling is the same, that they don't expect to be able to go in and change the country as a whole but they're doing whatever they can in every community that they can, and they operate in about a dozen different communities um, because of the ripple effects. And if you can plant a seed here and really mm -hmm. show that it works, it will ripple out in ways that you may not even understand, but those right. effects spread. Sure, sure. Something as simple as the soccer field that uh, Sana was talking about, that's going to be op opened up to the general community, not just to the children on the school mm -hmm. days. So when kids are, are given uh, whether it's competitive sports or something to keep them busy or they, uh, you know, if you go watch the Bulls game, you got 20,000 fans, the thing they have in common is, they, oh, I want to watch the Bulls win. So everybody's <laughs> mm -hmm. giving each other high fives and all that. Right. It creates a common denominator. Sports is an is excellent way to, to bring young people together. Mm -hmm. So regardless of your religion, your background, your ethnic background, what language you speak, when you're on, on that soccer field and playing games together, you get along with your teammates, that brings forth something really you know, camaraderie and, and other things, and hopefully that little seed can grow. And you know, these are the future mm -hmm. uh, prime ministers and future generals that they will think twice before they fire that gun. We yeah. will hope. Yes. We hope. Yeah. yeah. Um, and on on that note, um, with respect to giving back and becoming successful leaders, the uh, the children who are housed at this orphanage, um, they're all they're also educated and. Mm -hmm. At the, once school, they t at right. the school, and once they they turn 18, um, they're not forced to move out. They're still cared for, and because the church believes that if they were to be uh, nurtured in this way, in this mm -hmm. fashion, and they become successful, that they would also uh, return the favor by taking care of um, the future generations of the of the orphanage and the home. Well, there's been about 10 years of history for the um, for the orphanage. Has, this, has it played out that way? I, I know that yes, I, I know that uh, there are 18-year-olds who right now are uh, are being assisted with respect to their uh, their university education, mm -hmm. and the hope is that they're able to graduate and get jobs and then come back and assist or volunteer with the with the orphanage. I would think that would be a natural inclination. You know, I mean, even here you see sure. people giving back to their alma mater just for no other right. reason than they went there, um, but particularly in this case where the kids have been helped out so much. And in their they, greatest time of need, they will, they will mm -hmm. not forget that. That when mm -hmm. their own biological parents abandoned them, their families abandoned mm -hmm. them, there's a stranger that took them in. Yeah. Uh, and, and particularly uh, when they see what the alternative would be, because I'm sure that even in, in Jordan there are homeless kids oh, yeah. who, who struggle and who uh, you know, didn't, aren't fortunate enough. So all you need to mm -hmm. do is look at the, you know, there for the grace of God go I. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and to know that this is something that becomes an obligation, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I was actually told by a priest here in Chicago a few years ago that, um, that the person who opens up the church every morning mm. is a, a young Muslim man. And the reason he does that is because he was raised in Lebanon, he was an orphan, and he was raised by nuns, and so he grew up in the church. He's a practicing Muslim, but to give back to God, he goes to the church and he uh, volunteers to open the church every morning. You know, I just wish that there were ways to get these stories more widely distributed. Um, because, as I say, you know, you hear so much propaganda. I, well, 
I consider it propaganda, but the, the news media, particularly in this country, seems to be have a point of view that really is not very favorable to Muslims in particular, but uh, to really anyone outside of the so-called traditional American way of life. Uh, and these are stories that just confound that, that, uh, that stereotype um, and show that there's a different way. And it would just be wonderful to have this, have everyone be able to hear these stories and see that it, there is an alternative. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks to you, obviously, to Comcast and to your team here for making this possible. Uh, that's how the message is going to get out to people. And uh, yours is a wonderful ministry. I mean, the broadcasting, getting the message out is truly a blessing uh, that I know we are very grateful. We appreciate the opportunity. Otherwise, we would never get the word out. So <laughs> even if only yeah. one person watches this, uh, that's, that's one more person. That's, that's one reached, more person. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can never underestimate how God operates. We do our small part, and we have to trust that God will do His part. Well, it's mm -hmm. one of the wonderful things about um, cable access TV, that uh, we can talk about whatever we'd like to. There's no mm -hmm. commercial interference or management interference. Uh, yeah. So we actually have complete freedom to talk about whatever subject we think needs to be aired. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons that uh, we do this show is to give voice to the people who might otherwise have a tough time breaking through and get their messages out. So, um, well, glad you appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, there are people watching this show. What can they do to, to help you out at this point? They can go to our website and uh, they can learn more about the project and we'll also post upcoming events. And the website is uh, St. Mary OC. Yeah, uh, uh, c uh, currently it's connected to our parish's website. Mm -hmm. uh, I serve uh, as an assistant at St. Mary Orthodox Church in Palos Heights. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, the website is St. Mary, as in St. Mary, mm -hmm. St. Mary OC for Orthodox Church dot org. St. Mary OC dot org. As you say it, we're displaying it on the screen. Oh, you are. So Thank people you. People <laughs> at home can actually see that in writing. Okay. Terrific. Um, and thank God for technology, I tell you. <laughs> right. yes. And we do yeah. have a complimentary event. Um, it's for purposes of presenting the project and having the community learn about the project. It'll be at uh, Pazzo's Cucina Italiana at 101 North Wacker on November 29th. And we'll present the project and we're, we're also procuring sponsors. We already have secured certain sponsors and we're hoping to get more sponsors. And then we'll keep um, hosting other fundraisers in the future. That will be posted on the website. That right. will be posted on, on the website. And our goal is to have uh, the funds raised by February so that we can break ground and then um, hopefully have everything built, well, the boys' home built by the summer. So for those who may actually see this in reruns sometime in February, they can still contribute, right? They can yes, still contribute. It's an ongoing project? Yes, right. sir. Right, and they can do that online via the website, correct? Exactly. Right, um, and there's more information there that they can, they can gather and they can go and see what's going on? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of information available, and uh, uh, on St. Mary's website, there's also phone numbers they can call us. Uh, they can, my email address is on there. They can send me an email. I would love to hear from anyone. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I hope that they will. I hope you are flooded with calls and, thank and you. emails. Thank you. I um, hope so, too. So we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for being oh, here. Oh, how sad. That was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have you back after the project is complete thank and we go you. to the next phase, right? May the grace of God thank and His blessings be with you and your team and all of your listeners. Well, thank you. So, Father thank Malik, Sana, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, thank you once again. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for joining us once again on Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can see us every Saturday night on Comcast Channel 19 at 8 o'clock. And you can also find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So until next time, thank you and good night.